Hey guys, welcome back to the Soul Rocker Podcast, and I'm your host, Vanessa Delgado. So in today's episode, I want to change things up a little bit and take you guys on my childhood memory lane of my favorite 1990s um, movies and films. So mind you, I just want to remind you guys that I am 34, so I was born in uh, um, 88, so I definitely grew up with the 90s era. And... Back when I was a little kid, like I used to watch movies all the time because I was like such a and I wasn't into sports or anything. And I had friends, but I also spent a lot of like alone time and watching movies was definitely like one of my favorite things to do. And I had plenty of movies that um, my mom like would buy me in VHS and I would literally like just rewatch them so much. It was like so funny. So those are the movies that I'm going to be talking about today. Like I watched a whole bunch of other movies like, you know, back when like Blockbuster was out and stuff like that. Like we would go all the time to rent movies and I would rent movies like the new ones. But also I, I rented a lot of like the old ones and we would sometimes like go in and literally like rent out like 15 movies because, you know, like the ones that were older films like you can keep those for like seven days and they were a lot cheaper and um then like the ones that were hotter and like newer you had to return like one day out you know so that that was really fun so I watched a lot of movies that way but I also watched some on tv as well but today's movies are going to be the ones that I owned and I like literally watched all the time so the first one, and this is like not in a specific order, um, but the first one is that uh, Clueless. So, oh my God, I remember I was in grade school and at the time I had, I had these two best friends and we would try and like literally dress the same and kind of copy their outfits. We would literally rehearse all like all the lines and like, <laughs> could you guys guess like which one I was like pretending to be? I know some people are like, oh, you probably were like, we're share. Like, no, I was actually Dion or, you know, Stacy Hat Dash. <laughs> I think of it now. I'm like, dude, that's hella racist. But no, I'm just kidding. That wasn't. No, was, and I say that sometimes because like my two friends like were white. So I, of course, had to be like the black girl, you know, but it's all good. Like it was it was like not malicious and I was not tripping over it. But um. So I looked up to both like Cher and Zion for like different reasons as a kid. And like I loved the girly vibes in like the movie. And I think what seemed to stand out to me from like a young girl's perspective was that Cher. And and when I say mean girl, like young girl's perspective means like myself at that time. And that was like Cher was like she seemed like she, like she was beautiful and she, like she had it all. But like at the same time, you know, not. And it was like. She, you know, because it's like she had no mom, her dad was always working, and I was like, hmm, like I, I think she's popular because it's like she seemed like she was popular, but at the same time, there's like a lot of like aspects that you couldn't really tell. And you know, it was like it seemed like she only had like Dion as like her main friend, of course, she had a f- few other people, but you know, Amber was like to me, Amber was definitely not a friend, and not until like Ty, which was like Brittany Murphy who comes in to be the, like the third character um in their close like little f- uh, friendship like group and i felt like i related to that more like introvert tone and how people assumed that she had like a, a perfect life um because from the outside that you know in that's what it looked like and i remember watching that movie and i lowkey like i lowkey had a crush on Josh i like ps like i have some of the names and like their film um years like written down because I'm terrible with like names um so I have that in front of me but um anyway so I was attracted to him not because he was like necessarily like cute but like he was he was like awkwardly like nerdy and just different and kind of had like this sweet tone like to him and I think that's what really like drew me to him so the next movie was Matilda I mean, like, classic with the chocolate cake and Danny DeVito, right? So, like, if you heard episode three, then you probably can see how I loved this movie. Uh, Number one, because of this special connection I felt between Matilda and I for being, like, different. 
not by any means can like I make shit flow but you know what I mean but I had admired her so much for like her strength to like accept herself and I felt like I could relate to how she didn't fit in with her family Matilda had some like terrible parents and uh I saw I wanted to beat them up (laughs) and I mean come on like Matilda and and her love for books like she was like low-key trying to be me so hard (laughs) I'm kidding. Um, but oh my god, so I lived for Miss Honey. Like her and her friend Lavender, bro. Like I was like, I wanted a lavender in my life. So Miss Honey was like the sweetest person and like teacher. And I remember wishing I had a teacher, like male or like female, who is soft and gentle and someone who I could connect with like that. Because I never had any teachers that felt that way. They were just like, I don't know. And um Miss Trunchbull, like, was a trip. Her teeth had me gagged. <laughs> that bun and those socks, though. <laughs> oh, my gosh. So, anyways, I really was loving the ending part where Matilda got adopted by, um... Like, that was probably, like, one of my favorite parts. Like, when she got adopted by Miss Honey and they took back her like big ass house and revamped it and and they they made it all warm and cozy and like brightened it up compared to like that dark ass dungeon trench belt was had going you know and um how they scared her ass away was like hilarious but um all right so the next film is uh she's all that which was a 1999 film so that was like right around the corner of 2000 but i wanted to say include because i watched that one a lot you know when it came out like it was like i watched it a lot and um let's see so freddie prince jr was definitely i was definitely crushing and again i feel like i really like some of the these movies for the main characters who stood out and were like different and i could resonate with that in some way like all the time and i liked like i liked laney boggs for having a passion for art even though like i wasn't into art but i just really liked how like cool it was even though like I couldn't relate because I just was I've always been like really terrible at art but it was like one of those things where I wish I was good at and that was her thing and like she was she was like a loner and she was herself and despite the storyline of this like popular cute jock who made this bet with this nerdy unattractive girl to turn her into like the school's prom queen uh, something Lainey could give, like, something that Lainey could literally give a shit about, you know? And, like, it validated my experiences that I never felt like that, like, I'd never felt that attractive and cool enough. And how Zach actually ends up falling for her kind of gave me hope that, like, hmm, you know, maybe it's possible that that could, like, deep down I always, like, felt like I wasn't good enough for a guy to fully like me. So I was like, well, clearly, like, that's... Like, it, it kind of just gave me hope that, like, sometimes you just have to be yourself and, you know, it could happen. I actually was, like, really annoyed at Paul Walker in this film because he was, like, this arrogant asshole who is always, like, instigating and I never was a fan of that. And Taylor Vaughn, like, because we always have that, like, mean girl in the storyline who always, like, really turns out that she, like, it's like she's like I always picture it like now it's like oh she's the mean girl who like I can see the the way that she outwardly like punishes people for how she really feels inside you know and of course like you know you guys know I have to bring psychology up in here like that's just who I am. <laughs> like I can't avoid that um as a matter of fact like I recently shared on a personal like Instagram uh story where I was like I literally cannot help but to at this point in my life where I, everything that I watch, I like literally find like a deeper message. I like, like, how does this connect to me and in my past and my current life? And how does this like, you know, like, how does this fit? And how does, you know, these characters mirror me? And like, what are the archetypes? Like, th- there's just so much that like, I can dig into. And I, I just find that really interesting. And things just like, films are just, they don't have like, it could be anything. And they're always... There's always something that you can learn from movies. So, like, these movies are all fun and bring nostalgia, but they also are helpful to connect myself to, to like, my past. And in many ways, like, both bring comfort, but also, like, bring growth because, like, where I am now making, like, I've 
watched a lot of these re- movies like just literally within the last like recent like time like within the last year and I'm just like really making these connections of my past self and where I was at and how my young self like associated things or fantasized with um you know with sort of like a programmed and formed a lot of these like beliefs both positive and negative based on some of these movies you know so anyway so the ending was cool because she toned down her like her look and she makes more of who she was um but like her new experiences you know of this transformation created like new versions of herself and she made improvements with her family as well and like the confession of the feelings that Zach, you know like everything worked out you know so that was really that was really cool to see um now in so this is like a little bit of a different uh twist to uh what i was kind of used to watching so like rush hour which was a 1998 film i think this was this was one of the movies that i basically became a fan of jackie chan so the duel between him and chris tucker was like literally hilarious and this was like a whole different like i was saying like a whole different style of movie for me because i normally chose like movies that had a heavy kid or like teen female lead like you know like chick flicks type of movies and this was a third um like more mature and action plus like comedy films that i watched and enjoyed no matter how many times like i rewatched them because i am actually combining another couple of movies in this like aspect of um my shares which had like a similar tone to them because of their kidnapping and comedy like plus action which was Chris Tucker was also, um, as a lead character, which was, uh, Money Talks, uh, which was a 1997 film. And I think, I think it was a comedy in Chris Tucker, that fan that I was hooked and like, I liked rewatching whenever I needed to, like a good laugh because often I yearn for like emotional connection and, uh, the need to have that met often came from watching like these movies that I, you know, like these little kid, like, you know emotional like chick or like female lead um movies so because really the first different more mature film i was introduced to with comedy and like drama was actually friday so that was a 19 1999 or i'm sorry 1995 film which is obviously like a major classic right and a lot of these are but this is where I was introduced to Chris Tucker originally and Ice Cube and I started to become familiar with like a different set of actors and actresses that I still love today. Like, all you know, n- was her face like Nia Long and, you know, just like Debo, like everyone on the on the thing on that film. These films felt more like actual films. And this film was uh, uh, also the reason why I ended up adding Boys in the Hood which was a 1991, 1991 film. So actually, I did not watch that one back in the early time when it came out. Like I ended up watching it towards, you know, once I started like in 95 around there, 98 possibly even. Could have been between that time where like I ended up saying like, oh, like there's a, there's a movie that came out several years ago, you know. Um, so I ended up adding Boys in the Hood to my collection, um, which I had owned uh, as considered more of a, you know, because it was a more of a drama crime. And this one became a little bit more of a different style of film because suddenly it's like I was able to see and understand a little differently about a reality that felt real, although not to me, but not the way that I was raised, but I felt like I could see in the lens of someone who was, or like maybe had experienced, you know, that in like real life. And this was a movie where I felt uh, a different set of like emotions than like the typical chick flicks type of like kid movies that I had been watching. And I made like a huge connection with, you know? So like when Ricky was shot or when Trey walked in and started punching the air and got like on his knees, basically there were a lot of scenes that were like really eye opening and, now back to some all-time fave and kid-based movies I rewatched so many times was The Little Rascals, which was a 1994 film, and I loved this movie for the in- innocence and like fun family comedy. I remember watching this a couple times with my mom, and that was always like kind of fun. And I was really never a fan of like I was never really a fan of musicals, like or and I'm still really not. But this is one that 
like probably like it was the only type of like musically related type of film that I actually watched and I just really enjoyed it. Uh, another one is Mrs. Doubtfire, which was a 1993 film. And okay, so now this is where I became familiar and a fan of Robin Williams. So, so like when Jack came out in 1996, I was like really, really excited to watch, which was also like a movie that I owned and I rewatched a lot. So Mrs. Doubtfire connected me a lot to that like aspect of me who experienced divorce and having like split split parents. And I remember thinking, man, how like this is me back then, like thinking like now, like how really does he like love his kids? Because look to what measure he went through to be close to them, which is something that I secretly like always wanted my um my dad to do, you know, in a way. Like obviously not to that like babysitter degree, but like there's something about that that I felt like I wish my dad would have done. Maybe you might be wondering like, so where is your favorite type of movies? Um like what part of like part in the movie is like your favorite? And honestly like I really don't have like a favorite part in any movie. Um, because I don't know, I just really like like the whole entire movie and I can never pinpoint like a favorite part in like each movie. And I think like, so Jack, I thought was like a brilliant idea. So Robin, Robin Williams, like inner child to me seemed to be very present in in quite a bit of his, uh, films. And I I didn't actually own like Jumanji, but it was one that I rewatched a lot like on TV and I would rent it. And that one was a 1995 film. And anyways, I felt like he did this really excellent job at his character role in Jack. Like he literally nailed it. And I loved how sweet and supportive and encouraging his parents were. And I mean, come on, like J-Lo as his teacher, Ms. Marquez was, it was always like, good to see because I was I've always been a fan of JLo and again she was serving the nice teacher who looks like she felt like I felt like there was a a couple of scenes where she looked like she really was like inspired by Jack which was which is like one of the sweetest things to feel like damn you can you know I remember like that's when I kind of realized that like anybody can be inspired by anyone it doesn't have to be that you're younger or older like you could be younger than someone and you could be anyone and you can inspire people and I remember feeling so excited for him when like the kids at school began to accept him like are you surprised that I loved this film for his genetic like genetic uniqueness and how like likable he actually was which was all the things that I have always struggled with and honestly in this film I had two favorite scenes which is probably like one of um the only movies that I actually felt like I had like a really like fun like favorite scenes and one was when they had the slumber party in the tree house and they got to eating some nasty stuff and all they started like they started rapping and <laughs> stomping their feet and like they're like the whole tree far- house was like about to fall down and I felt like in like in that moment, he truly felt accepted and like he belonged and they were like just they were just having so much fun. And I just thought that and that just like brought me such like a big smile. Like my heart was just like was filled with like, I don't even know, like these butterflies. And the second scene was the end part where I always cried because like where he's he's graduating and he gives a speech and like they're in graduation and then they get into the convertible and they drive away like oh that was so sweet and touching a random fact about robin williams that i learned that he was from chicago like i had no idea which i thought it was pretty cool now i don't want to get into detail because it's like a whole other episode but it's a good reminder that despite like the talent despite his ability to be funny and like his career and money and you know that in the end like how important it is to deal with like our mental health and how we all have something to improve or heal on, like in a way, really make peace and get closure on the on the things like we experienced in our past. You know, like this is why to me personally, it's become a main and huge focus as a necessity and need. 
and I, I don't live a day in my life in the last several years where I don't dedicate time to my mental health in some way. And like if it's up to me and if I have the ability, I try to do like to me, it doesn't satisfy me with just like 10 minutes or half hour. Like I have to spend a couple hours at least because it's like what good would having all this money and and career and whatever else like if I just struggle deep, deep inside. That was like the sad part of this uh, episode, but um, so let's back up, let's get back on track. Okay, so the Petition of the Beast was a 1997 film, and I feel like this one is not really a popular film. Like out of maybe most of these, like this is maybe one of the least um like known. But from the film Jack, I became familiar with the actress Fran Drescher. I think how you, is that how you say it. And I found a connection of this because of her being a cosmetologist with uh, which my mom became when I was like five years old. And I think I believe that she's the one that actually introduced me to the movie. And I didn't really have like much else I could relate to in this film from like my personal self. But it was one that I felt like really sparked curiosity about a lot of things that I noticed about like between her, her, like her connection with Pachanko, you know, like the, this cold, mean and emotionally disconnected man, you know, and his behavior towards his kids and it being based as this Eastern like Europe country. And I wondered about the, the common aspect of what was shown from the U.S. Like I was curious a lot about a lot of things like I wonder how other countries you know go about like raising their kids and about school like I just wondered a lot about that kind of thing and it's so funny because now I'm really really interested and again like making these connections over time um I realized that like oh it's so interesting that like I'm really really interested in like that's something that I weirdly do is I go on YouTube and I love watching just a lot of like people who um, migrate to like other countries and they're sharing their experience and how what are the differences between different cultures and why they like like there's so many people that move from all across the world into Mexico and I just find that to be so interesting and just like learning about different countries and comparing and I'm like, I would, you know, it's like something that I was curious about as a kid, like all of a sudden years and years later, now I'm like I, you know, without even thinking about it, it's like I became curious and continued that curiosity and has led me to to just like learn. And so now let's switching up a little bit. Like I had a couple Spanish classics I rewatched. So my two favorites was Selena, of course, which was a 1997 film. And then Mi Familia, which was a 1995 film which actually J-Lo also appears in the beginning of the film as um, like the young mom, young Maria. Hence, many of the other cast members like Edward James, Jimmy Smith, Isaiah Morales. Uh, this one reminded me in many ways of like my crazy ass family, <laughs> especially back at that very time, like even to the point of how we related with the Spanglish. And I did like watching like... I'm blanking out here. What's that movie called? Blood In and Blood Out. And then there was like another one. But I felt like they were were a bit too harsh for me. Like they were a little bit too, too real, too harsh. So I didn't really like it. Something about those movies actually triggered me. And it's just based on now I realize it's based on trauma stuff. But, um, yeah, so I, you know, I didn't really like to watch them too much. And we actually did have those in, like, part of, like, our collection of movies. But I just never gravitated much to those. And uh, a couple of movies that had a strong female lead that I loved rewatching was... And for me, like, I admired that, those kinds of films, because they represented, which was, like... To me, they represented like this strength and courageous and brave aspect to them. And I felt like they were smart and confident. And to me, that was like something that I aspired to be. And I felt like I did. I wasn't that in a way. So Monkey Trouble, which was a 1994 film, 
with Thora Birch, which I was a fan of her in her young like acting career because she came on a, a several other movies that I'll mention. But um, also A Little Princess, which was a 1995 film. And, and these may not also be as uh, popular, but um, and this one was uh, simply just like a Little Princess is like a really just beautiful and touching, heartfelt Warner Bros. film. And I would often like cry and just get really, really emotional. And Harriet the Spy, which was a 1996 film or what is uh, that, that one was a Paramount Pictures uh, Nickelodeon film. And her writing aspect is what I related with a lot. The nerdy and like imaginative, curious traits and in, in is what combined her love for like this detective spy, spy as well as her like journal writing is like in many ways as archetype I ended up I ended up in as like a as an adult you know and her like her small circle of friends and I was a huge fan of the Olsen twins okay so I watched and owned a lot of their films and shows but my all-time favorite was It Takes Two which was a 1995 film now I look back and I make more of a connection of how different their personalities were based on how like they were raised, but how cool to essentially have been adopted as like sisters and brought together with this whole situation where like the orphan, you know, Amanda's social worker, uh, which was Christy Alley, ends up becoming like the perfect fit for Alyssa's dad and how they made it their responsibility to like separate the evil stepmom, which was Clarice, you know, which was she was like after his money. And which would have like caused this instability between Alyssa's household. And now, even though, you know, so it's like, it's just wild to me that like now I'm making, um, not necessarily a connection to myself, but like just in psychology. And I'm like, yeah, that's, that's really crazy. Uh, now, now, even though like Lindsay Lohan isn't a twin, that's, what they did in the film, like the parent trap, right? So like they made it look like she was a twin, um, which was a 1998 film and who I became a, a fan of her other movies in the early like 2000s. And as a matter of fact, just recently I saw a tweet that was trending about this film and it's like, how is it that this, <laughs> I saw this. Yeah. So like, it was like, how is it that this married couple had twins and they split? So they, they said, Hmm, like, yeah, I don't like it was like, okay, so you take one kid and I'll take the other and we'll just pretend like this one doesn't exist, you know? And it's like, like, yeah, divorce is obviously really, really difficult. And so is like long distance, but on top of that, you know, but really it's like, you don't care about your other child as a parent who does not see them. Like, I totally agree at this. Like, I totally agreed at that, you know, point that the person did on that tweet because it was like, you know, like back then, I, like I see that I did see that now when I recently watched the movie. So it was funny when I saw that tweet, I was like, this is exactly what I thought. But back then, like it was not something that I thought about. Like to me back then, when I thought when I watched those movies, I was like, yep, exactly. Like destiny calls no matter what. Like, like look at how the small the world is actually so small or how it can actually be so small and like you literally can't hide forever or you can't keep a secret forever and I think that kind of a message came from my mom because she would always say I couldn't hide from her too long you know I wasn't the best like I wasn't the best at lying and being a mom while well, she was a mom and then secondly you know because they say like oh being a mom like I always I know when my kid feels something is going through something right and so secondly like being intuitive she was like I'll find out and it's better if you just, you know, are straightforward with me rather than me having to like find out and, you know, whatever. So it's like I adapted that mindset into other things. So that's how I kind of made that connection back then. Now, the last couple of movies were Now and Then, which was a 1995 film. And like, damn, 1995 was definitely a great year. <laughs> Because a lot of these movies are from that year. So now so now and then, uh, the cast was... So this is where Thora Birch from Monkey Trouble 
And she actually was also on the on the film, which was another favorite of mine, which was Hocus Pocus. And that was a 1993 film. Now and then also had a cast, um, had cast members um, that I was familiar with, like Christina Ricci, Demi Moore, Rosie O'Donnell, you know, which those stood out to me the most uh, compared to some of the other ones. But this film was packed with like friendships and home struggles and the different aspects of personal like differences as young girls because they struggled with like different you know not just home struggles but they also kind of had like their own like personal struggle struggles like for example you know Christina Ricci um struggled with like her boobs were growing and like that was one of the the things that she just like was concentrated on so much was like trying to like make them stop growing she would like put tape on her tits and <laughs> She was just like a tomboy and then it's like low key. It's like she was trying to avoid having crushes on on boys. But like there was a a boy that had a crush on her and she kind of was like crushing back, but like trying not to. So, you know, it was like stuff like that. And now here's like the funny thing is that as I have like, again, rewatched these movies as an adult and make further connections. But as things have developed over in my life, it's this like yearning for a small female group bond where we can connect genuinely and like emotionally. That's something that I, like I said, I learned that that was something that I, you know, was wanting so badly. And I, this is the way that I was satisfying that need was through these movies. And that's why I would watch them over and over again. Because I knew that that's where I could get that. Like, I already knew, okay, this is what it's going to make me feel, you know. And there was all, like, positive things. Even though I can also have a moment where I could escape and to feel like I was accepted. But also this, um, in this movie, uh, Now and Then, this motivation by Samantha's interest in the occult. So, which was totally me now like at the time I didn't it wasn't something like it was because it was a part of my life as a kid in most of my life at the same time I didn't really accept it like many other things in my life (laughs) about myself but um you know so it was like so because I really didn't accept it I wasn't really you know I didn't really make that connection with her but now I do see the connection and Hocus Pocus is a classic like so going on to the Hocus Pocus one so Hocus Pocus is a classic Disney movie right so like this was literally like just my favorite like comfort movie during Halloween and Sarah Jessica Barker was definitely my favorite because she was like the most attractive and small one so I (laughs) um so the last film that kind of had this like psychology aspect um but like in recent times, as I like I said, I keep saying over and over again, but like, you know, from re- me rewatching and connecting things, I saw how, again, something that I come to become really interested in uh, is psychology. And back then, like I had no uh, no interest in like even related it to that or like, you know, thought about it. But it definitely had this psychology aspect in the movie because and so bogus it was a film, an 1996 film, and this is with uh, Whoopi, Whoopi Goldberg, which is the only main actor, actress that I know, because I didn't even know the main actor, which was the kid. And this was a Warner Bros. film, and essentially Albert uh, comes, so she, he ends up going to live with Whoopi Goldberg, which is like the mom's, I forgot what she was, like the mom's like friend or something and basically he he and he ends up coping from becoming an orphan from losing his parents in a car accident and he makes up this imaginary friend which is named bogus and through this like phase that he is like essentially coping using as a coping mechanism of the trauma of you know this friend And it's like he he comes to terms, but like over, you know, throughout the movie, it's like he ends up coming to terms with like the loss of his parents and, you know, ends up improving because it's like he ends up, you know, he he didn't talk for a little while and then he ends up talking. And it's like that imaginary friend, which is really just 
kind of like his himself essentially um you know ends up helping him through that um trauma aspect and in an unexpected way that whole situation also helps his new caregiver with her with her own feelings and um you know it's just like a really awesome movie that that I like all these movies that I still love and I rewatch and I'm just like I always just continue to make more comparisons and more like connections and I'm like wow it's it is just so so crazy so I'd love to know if any of you guys can resonate with any of these movies and or I'd love to hear what your favorite movies are so you can find me um if the, if you're listening to on YouTube like uh, you know leave a comment um or you can go over to my Instagram where you can leave a comment I usually always post a make a post on the episode and you can leave a comment there or you know send over a message and if you are enjoying this podcast please leave a uh you can leave a rating or a review over at Apple I would really appreciate that and until next time thank you